In 1941, with the production of the M3 light tank well underway, it was thought that perhaps there would be some concern over whether or not there would be any engine availability. After all, it was an aircraft engine. Not only might simple production of the vehicle's hull outstrip the ability of the engine supplier, but there was also the simple possibility that the aircraft manufacturing industry may grab the aircraft engine production capacity. As a result, in a manner perhaps similar to that of the M3 Medium, a search was undertaken to test all other engine types that were available. In July of 41, it was decided that M3 number 752 be taken in hand and converted into an M3 E2. This involved taking out the radial engine and the manual transmission and replacing them with twin Cadillac V8s and a hydromatic. It was thought that with the cessation of automobile production in the US, that supply of these components would be readily available. A few thousand miles later, the Army figured out that they were onto a winner. The twin motors were a lot quieter than the radial engine. They were easier to start, particularly in low temperatures. The power output was lower down. That meant you had more room inside the vehicle. And the hydromatic transmission meant that the vehicle was very, very easy to drive. Thus it was that in November 1941, the vehicle was ordered into production as the M4. After a little while, somebody copped on to the fact that basically everything seemed to be being called the M4, and it was getting a bit confusing. There was also the M4 medium tank, there was the M4 gun motor carriage, the tank destroyer. So, a little bit of rejiggling of the names later, the tank destroyer was renamed as the M6, and the M4 light tank was renamed as the M5. And under that nomenclature, the first tanks rolled off the production line in April of 42. In total, 2,074 M5s were built until production changed to this one. Now, this M5A1 came with a new turret with an elongated bustle to allow the installation of a radio. This particular tank is currently located at the Rock Island Auction Company, and in a couple of weeks, it's up for sale. As you look at the front of the vehicle, well, next to the shovel, uh, behind the bush guard, suitably protected, are your service light, marker light, and the siren and the blackout light would ordinarily be here as well. As you can see, of course, they are not on this particular vehicle. A windshield is, however, provided for the vehicle and mounted. It does demount. And, of course, it is used only in low-threat environments. You put it up, you're driving with your head out the hatch, and it keeps the bugs out of your face. Just underneath it, you are going to see what the manual describes as an emergency vision knockout plug. And the theory is that if your periscope gets hit, well, yes, there are spares carried in the vehicle. You slop out, you slot up, and you, know, you keep going. Should you run out of spares, or let's say you just don't have the time to do the change, knock out the plug, and you can now see where you are going through the hole in the armor. It's not really a huge hole, but if it's just you and your eyeball, uh, directly exposed to the outside world and all the hot pieces of metal, it probably feels very large indeed. As you move down, you'll see this protective ridge. Now, it was noted that the bolts holding on the transmission were vulnerable, so shots would come in, they would ricochet off the armor of the tank. The tank was fine, but it would also damage the bolt, and it would be very difficult for maintenance purposes to get the bolt out and replace things. The solution was to protect the bolts, and this ridge here does exactly that. Now, there are other methods of doing it. For example, you look on a Sherman, you'll see that uh, the bolts get more sunken in. But this will do the job just as well. As we move further over, uh, you do see the blower housing uh, in between the two hatches for the driver and the bog. Another knockout port, lifting eyes, very important, of course, because everything has to be transferred across the water. Another surface life, more markers, and then you get around to the side. And so we come to the running gear. Now we've seen it before, vertical volute, nothing particularly new there. It's the same advantages and disadvantages as on a medium tank and TDs apply. In case of damage, you simply pull one off, put one back in again, very easy. On the other hand, well, the ride is not necessarily the greatest. This particular one, though, does allow us a learning point. You will see that the lead road wheel is not pressing the track down onto the surface. 
This indicates the suspension problem. Now, ordinarily, the way you would check for suspension problems is you take your tanker bar, your four foot pry bar, and you would attempt to leverage the wheels as they are sitting on the ground. If you can lift the wheel up and down, the chances are that your suspension is broken. Well, on the end wheels, you don't even need to do that. It's very obviously there is no pressure pushing this wheel down onto the track, onto the surface. So it seems likely that one, if not both, of these volute springs are broken. However, you don't actually need to replace the bogey. In a case like this, the entire structure can be dismantled in the field, and there is instructions in the manual for taking it apart and replacing the spring, putting it back together again without even taking off the bogey. So there's uh, a little advantage there. F smaller spare parts can be shipped overseas, because remember, a bogey takes a lot of space on your ship. And everything's got to go overseas. I keep harping on about this in all the videos. And so it's a lot more efficient to ship just the volute springs than it is the entire bogey, even though the bogey can be replaced as a unit if it is sufficiently badly damaged. The tracks are dual pin, they're connected by these end connectors which also have your guide horns. There are 67 links per side, the tracks are 11 and 5 8 inches wide, the system will span a 5 and a half foot trench or scale a 2 foot vertical obstacle. Now the track is rubberized on both sides equally. The theory is that as you're driving along, you wear out one side of the track, you simply flip it over and then you wear out the other side of the track. Fantastic, it saves on shipping space for starters. Well, there's theory in their practice, because if you're flipping this thing over, that means that there's uh, 268, I think, of these end connectors that you've got to flip over as well, and it's a royal pain to do all that. When we would try that in Iraq, we just flat refused to change the pads. We just said change the track instead. It's easier. After all, the guys on the field are not responsible for shipping, and they don't really care. Now, you will see attached to the turret side additional grousers. And because these rubber blocks sometimes don't provide enough traction, what you can do is you can mount them on the outside of the end connectors, generally speaking, one every eight links. And this will give you the extra grip that you need. Moving up, stretching my legs a little bit for a moment, the side of the hull is completely barren and has nothing to talk about whatsoever, not even a stowage bin, which is slightly unfortunate. On the plus side, though, the top side here is very flat and is suitable for having a little bit of kip, as one of the troopers can get some sleep on it. Further back is the external pull for the fire extinguisher. Now, the theory is that if you're bailing out of your tank because your engine's on fire, you yank this and you keep running. It's a technique still taught today, and you know, once things have cooled down, you walk forward and what, you see whether or not your fire extinguisher has actually put out the fire. Moving up to the turret, well, this is not the authorized stowage position for the tow cable, for obvious reasons. There's actually some hooks on the far side. There is no pistol port on this particular turret, although it was common on a lot of them. You can see the grousers I just mentioned earlier. Now, the machine gun, the caliber 30 M1919 A4 is moved from its earlier position on the M5 to this new one on the side of the turret. And you will see on some much later vehicles, there is a protective shield on the right hand side of the M5A1's turret. The 30 cal will then fold down and be protected from getting caught in tree branches, power cables, or the like, or maybe even some small arms fire, although that shield is not particularly thick and protective. Coming down to track tension, no, I didn't forget, it is measured in between the first and second return rollers. Now the manual states that what you do is you take your tanker bar and you apply downward force in the middle of 175 pounds. It does not specify in the manual how you are supposed to estimate 175 pounds in the field. Good luck. Once you have done this, you've kind of increase the sag up at the top. You then take a straight edge and it suggests the use of a plank and you measure the deflection in the middle between five eighths and three quarters of an inch. If it's within that range, you're good to go. If not, well, you got to make an adjustment. This is, of course, done at the trailing idler and it's simplicity itself. You pull out this cotter pin, undo the nut, which holds the locking plate against the toothed guide arm, and you are now free to take your spanner and screw the thing backwards or forwards. Now bear in mind that there's one on the far side as well. So this means that you either have to have two blokes 
going away with the spanners or you do one or two cranks and you go around and do one or two cranks on either side and it probably gets very annoying very irritating very quickly either way it's easy but once it's done put the whole thing back together away you go now while I'm here I'll also make mention of these little metal plates here you'll see this is marked as a Marine Corps tank and in the Pacific there is a theory going around that the Japanese were disabling tanks by shoving large metal rods into the running gear and locking the whole thing up. Now remember in 1940 or so the US Army did actually try tests to see whether or not they could immobilize the light tank by shoving metal rods in and they used gun barrels. The conclusion was quote light tanks are very efficient manglers of gun barrels unquote. But if you put something a little bit thicker I mean I'd say maybe a tanker bar might be good enough uh, then yes you are probably going to either jam the system or better yet break the wheel and require a replacement. So the solution as I say was weld these little patches in where the lightning holes would otherwise be. The rear of the tank brings us no huge surprises. I mean your standard array of tail lights, Pioneer equipment, a tanker bar is missing. Uh, there's a track jack on the end there and the track jacks are what you use to hold the tracks together as you're hammering on the end connectors. This is an exhaust deflector, not just exhaust, but also all the air coming out from the radiator system, from the two fans for the two cooling systems. Instead of being deflected straight downwards by the shape of the hull, it makes a bit of a left turn, so you don't have those huge clouds of smoke coming up and dust saying, hey everybody, here I am. Uh, it'll swing up out of the way, allows you to open up the swing doors for access to the engine compartment. In the far corners, for basically just directly in front of the track jack, is the air cleaner. And the air cleaner has to be serviced every 250 miles or so. And it's a little inconveniently located, so what they've done is there's a little panel underneath the sponson, and directly underneath the air cleaner. It's one bolt, it slides out of the way, and then you can unscrew the bottom of the air filter and change it that way. Every 250 miles, unfortunately. The big square thing on the back of the turret, well, that is for replacement of the 37 millimeter. So you don't have to pull off the mantlet with a crane at the front. You simply undo the back of that, and then you slide the 37 millimeter at the back. Very simple, much quicker. So now that I've lifted the deflector out of the way, I've opened up the engine compartment doors. You can see they're double hinged to allow them to clear the armor plate. Visible are the fans behind the twin Cadillac V8s, also the oil filler ports, the water pumps, and the fuel pumps. The engines, well, they're the Cadillac V8, 346 cubic inch plants, 110 horsepower apiece. Take eight quarts of oil, and they're expected to burn a half gallon every 600 miles. They come with their own independent cooling system and hydromatic transmission as well. The two engines together are expected to get the tank to a burst speed of about 45 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour sustained. The fuel tanks are located outboard of the two engines. Each is 44 and a half gallons. The whole system is supposed to get on the 80 octane fuel, a total of about 180 miles on the road. Now one of the nice things about these bogey tanks is getting up and down them is simplicity itself. You've got lots of places to put your feet. The engine deck is pretty obvious really. Fuel filler ports are the ones outboard for the outboard fuel tanks. And as I say, each cooling system is independent and thus has its own filler port as well. 35 quarts per if you're curious. The radiators are mounted horizontally. So what will happen is the air gets drawn in through the grills on either side of the radiator, through the engine compartment past the engines, propelled by those fans you saw, and then right out the back. As you can see, the engine deck is hinged, so you can unbolt the front end when you spin the turret around and lift it up and back, and it can access the radiators that way if you need to. Not the most convenient, but I guess it'll do. Okay, so the turret roof, two inches more or less on the mantlet, although it's only an inch and a quarter around the sides. As you move further back, you see the mounting point for the spotlight. There's a gunner's primary sight here, which is fixed in train for obvious reasons. The TC's periscope on the opposite side, though, will rotate and elevate. He has a second periscope in his turret hatch door. 
Uh, you can see also that the back of the turret is basically two large doors, one for the TC and one for the gunner. Anyway, that is it for part one. I will be back for the inside in part two, and I'll see you then.